Hi, I'm Bake Me Berserker and welcome back to my channel. One thing that gets discussed a lot in our community is what makes a good DM and what makes a good campaign. There's a plethora of advice out there around how to introduce adventures to your players, how to develop campaigns and how to keep players interested. What I want to focus on in this video are methods for beginning a Dungeons & Dragons homebrew campaign, which is a subject matter that comes up as requested quite often. How do you begin designing a campaign? Where on earth do you start? Well, I'm not going to tell you what to do, but I am going to show you what I did in creating a campaign world over 20 years that is fondly remembered by the players who explored it. For information, although the theory in developing a campaign is mostly system agnostic, the campaign world I began in the year 2000 initially supported the then new third edition, so if you hear a few things and wonder why it doesn't sound like Beckme, my preferred edition, then now you know. It shouldn't matter though, the steps I used to develop this campaign should work in just about any setting you devise. So let's get into it. The first thing I did, which I would recommend to anyone, is start small and build outwards. Building an entire world, or indeed just an entire country, from the outset is, in my opinion, a mistake. Apart from making things difficult for you, you are setting up an environment full of distractions from the outset. Sure, it's great to be able to facilitate your players being able to go wherever they want, but despite all the contemporary thinking around railroading, you still don't want your players setting off in unplanned directions just because the mountains on the horizon look nice. Although my intention was to build a campaign world, I wanted that world building to be informed by the players' actions over time and not for me to conduct nugatory work, designing locations and a history which may never be needed. Therefore, I decided to begin with a single homebrewed adventure and see where that led me. But what was this adventure to be about? And how was I to bring the characters together to care enough about doing it? This is where I thoroughly recommend seeking inspiration rather than waiting for something to occur to you. My approach was to leaf through published D&D content for ideas whilst also navigating the relatively new Wizards of the Coast website at that time for free maps. They used to have an excellent Map a Week page back then, which over the years built up an amazing catalogue of content. It was whilst navigating this page that I came across this image, which I loved from the outset. I understand it was from an early edition of Dungeon Magazine, so if any of you know which edition, please let us know. Indeed, other images I'll be showing in this video will also have come from the Map a Week page, so if greater minds than mine can reference them, then that would be really appreciated. So I had an image, and I had an idea forming. This quite obviously looked like a mine, and there were mountains. Okay, so my players were going to begin their adventuring lives in a small mining town. But what would such a town be called? Names of places are really important to me, and in my opinion should fall out of their activity, purpose and history much like the origins of many names. So, this town mined ore. Iron ore, to be precise. It is a town of ore. An ore town, known colloquially as Orton. It didn't take me long to rummage through the Wizards of the Coast site to find an image of a town that would suit. The text and numbers were added by me exhausting my skills with paint, which then only left me with the numbers to key to locations. As you can see, there are probably more watering holes and inns than might be appropriate at first glance, but Orton was a functional working town, more than a place to raise a family. Its business was iron, and it was transported down what I named the Jaron River, to an unknown location at this point. Otherwise, the town was served by a rudimentary marketplace, a couple of small temples, ones which I thought most relevant to miners, and probably the busiest location for a town teeming with this much testosterone, a local brothel. Keeping it real, I'm afraid. As all of this is firing through my brain, I'm linking back to the need for an adventure and thinking of ripping off the Tainted Ore quest from the original Baldur's Gate computer game, only released two years earlier in 1998. I knew that none of my players had a copy, so I was pretty safe from accusations of being unoriginal. However, I wasn't going to completely mirror it, I kept the key concept of the Tainted Ore, which I renamed Rotting Ore, but changed the reason why it was happening. So just to recap, I began with nothing, but after staring at a couple of illustrations online, 
My mind is firing all over the place. I have a town with a growing industry and some mysterious happenings up in the mines that investigating adventurers may want to explore further. What you might notice is that I don't have an overarching plot, and that suited me just fine. I also don't know where any of the roads or rivers lead from this town. I only put the direction to the monastery on the map because one of my players wanted to be a monk, but otherwise the campaign at this stage was quite narrow in scope, but ready to grow from the ideas of the players, already occurring through the inclusion of said monastery. A key element I needed before my first game was the cast of characters, the NPCs that will form the backdrop of Orton and breathe life into the campaign. In my opinion, this is the most time-consuming part of a campaign build, and if done right, turns an average campaign into a great one. If you are able to build relationships between player characters and NPCs over time, then you are developing shared values and a reason to work together, or animosity and a reason to become enemies. Poor NPC design results in interactions that become mechanical in nature, such as being reduced to facilitating fetch quests, rather than being more natural and free-flowing encounters, with room for the development of relationships. Although I could come up with numerous NPCs, I started with only a small number needed to facilitate the first adventure, specifically the quest setter, Dorstal Meadquaffer, who was the owner of the cave inn, but also the de facto mayor of the town and the leader of the local constabulary. I had a rudimentary idea of how the town worked, so if another NPC was needed quickly, I could make that available. And if a name was needed on the spot, well, I'd use the old trick of using a real-world name but switching out or swapping the vowels and seeing where that went. For instance, Derek could become Derak or Dirac. Stephen could become Staffan, but I might prefer Stapan or Stapani for a female. In my opinion, constructing names in this way has real-world echoes that help with immersion, rather than thinking of names that have no philological basis. Finally, I needed the characters to have a reason to risk their lives and I did this by using the age-old carrot of a previous party being hired and going missing. However, I made two members of this party relatives of the player characters, but you could motivate them further by having either of the missing relatives making off with the family's wealth, potentially to fund their ambition for adventure. Now, you're probably thinking that a lot of this campaign design is rooted in cliché and unoriginality, and you would be right. I've borrowed an idea from Baldur's Gate, the characters start in a mining town, and they're hired at a local inn. However, in my experience, why this works is because it is simple. In most cases, the players are keen to start, but also keen to absorb the world around them. Making this overcomplicated by prioritising the campaign backdrop over the character's place in it, in my experience, overwhelms players who really just want to get on with the game. That said, who are the player characters? An incredibly important part of campaign design is integrating the player characters into the environment, whilst remaining considerate of backgrounds and motivations. I'd been leaking a little bit of information to my four players here and there to help them build a character befitting of the campaign feel. This resulted in the following. Timori the Burned, a human sorcerer who had lost his family in a house fire many years ago and had become a twisted pyromaniac. Gideon of Cord a human cleric of Cord, who prizes physical strength and health above all things and wants to spread the benefits of worshipping the god of strength. Kalavaheim, an elven cleric of Weijas, exploring the mysterious divide between the divine and the arcane. And Gohon, a human monk striving to be as perfect as he can whilst running very fast. Clearly a sorcerer, two clerics and a monk, presented me with some challenges when it came to adventure design, but that's par for the course when being a DM. The thing I focused in on most was their names, specifically Tamori and Gideon. As I mentioned earlier, I think names are really important and can lend to world building in many different ways. Therefore, I parked the structure of Tamori's name to be used when meeting other sorcerers, or perhaps dragonkind, given that sorcerers in third edition were said to have dragon blood. Perhaps the names would always end in Ori or Mori. I wasn't sure, but it was food for thought. In respect of Gideon, I was presented with an opportunity to develop a naming convention. Removing Gid from the name gives Eon, perhaps spelt different to how we might do it, 
but it was still a name. Therefore, I made it that the prefix Gid was bestowed by the Church of Cord to all clerics once they had been found worthy of their god, that is, when they become a first-level cleric. So, taking the example names I mentioned earlier, Dirac might be Gidirac, or Stapani might be Gidstapani. This simple step enabled Gideon's player to go away and write up how he joined the church, and left Eon behind to become Gideon. This was quite a simple tactic that began to have a profound impact, as I also applied this method to Calabaheim, but stated that clerics of Wejas have their names prefixed by Cal. So again, we could have Cal Dirac, or Cal Stapani. So in effect, my player's choice of character name inspired how churches in my campaign world bestowed a prefix to the names of their clerics, and they could be identified this way as much as through their holy symbol, if they wanted themselves to be, of course. It wouldn't be prudent to advertise yourself as a worshipper of Vecna when making a reservation at the local tavern. So, with the characters firmly fixed to my world, the players go on the adventure, and they are reasonably successful, discovering an ancient dwarven artifact which I have named the Heart of Moradin, a fist-sized diamond which apparently cannot be removed from its discovered location. It turns out the rotting ore was a message from Moradin that something was wrong, and the players discovered that an evil sorceress had been attempting to relieve the artifact from its rightful place. It is the belief of the dwarves that the heart of Moradin is the keystone of the world, and that its removal would see the destruction of everything around them. So, pretty good timing on the part of the characters then. Now, all that probably sounds a bit too epic for first to third level characters, and I have to admit, I had put myself into a bit of a corner with that one, so I needed a diversion a second adventure, whilst word of this significant event spread. Already, I was finding that I needed to expand the environs around Orton to better gauge what might happen next, and also facilitate the second adventure. I couldn't continue to rely on convenient maps from the wizard site for this, so I turned to a new computer program available at the time called Campaign Cartographer 2 by Pro Fantasy Software. This was quite a technical bit of software at the time when map making tools were limited, I was far from proficient with it, so I apologise in advance for the rudimentary designs you're about to see. So I had a mining town called Orton that sat by the Jaram River, under the shadow of what I called the Melting Mountains, named thus due to the fantastic avalanches that occurred every spring. The river flowed southeast towards a city that I decided to call Tiresias, a name that might be familiar to those of you who know their classics, but also with some significance in terms of an idea that was forming in my head. I like to hide things in plain sight in my games, something that frustrates the hell out of my players, but it's all good and keeps them alert and checking everything. No name is without meaning. Let's stop there a moment and focus on names again whilst referring to this map. To the south of Orton, I put a small village called Loose Chippings, which serves a local quarry. If you're from the UK, the term Loose Chippings should be familiar to you, as it is seen on road signs where roads have been recently relaid. Loose chippings just sounded like a decidedly English village name when sitting next to a quarry, so I went with it. Seaguard and Northwatch are naval ports. Minton is, guess what, a mint, and the producer of the nation's coins. And as for this nation, I simply named it the Duchy of Tiresias, which was under the dominion of a larger state off-map. I held off developing that, as it wasn't needed at this point. This turned out to be a good decision, as the characters never ended up being motivated to go there, somewhat backing up this campaign development method which starts small and grows outward, as required. So let's reel things back a bit. I developed an adventure hook, making plenty use of material already out there to save time. I developed a hometown and tied the players to it, through their backgrounds and identities. They went on the adventure which had wider implications for the town and its surroundings. This caused me to have to develop those surroundings, even if they were just to be place names at this point, but essentially their development was a reaction to current circumstances, and therefore I could make things instantly relevant to the campaign. And alongside all this, I began thinking of a second adventure. This ended up being a trip to a nearby wood called Corpus Cops, after the party were hired by a local near-do-well to locate a hidden abandoned manor in the woods and seek its treasures. As it turned out, the near-do-well, 
a thief named Kel, was only after a bit of muscle to get him to the location safely and double-crossed them at the first opportunity. It turned out the manor, again inspired from the Map a Week page, was far from abandoned and Kel had assassinated the owner, one Frederick Corper, a local sheriff, and he wanted to recover some incriminating evidence. As it turned out, Kel fell foul of Corper's vengeful spirit, a white, but the party did not engage with it, setting things right within the home and retrieving evidence of what happened, thereby freeing Corper's spirit from its undead shell. What was this evidence? Well, I thought of it on the spot. No planning, no idea of where I was going with this. It was a knife. A dagger. A dagger with a gunmetal coloured blade. It was what I, in the moment, called a dark knife. I couldn't find a decent picture that fit my imagination 20 years ago, but this will certainly do. This was it. The key to the campaign that I was waiting for, inspired from running what seemed like unrelated scenarios until my head was absolutely brimming with ideas. The party returned to Orton to find the town in turmoil. They discovered that Mayor Dorstal Meadquaffer had also been assassinated whilst they were away, and the party were in possession of what might be an incriminating weapon. They needed allies, and also information about the weapon itself. So they took a chance and met with someone who had, up until that point, just been a name on the town map. But now, enter stage, Quilford the Sage. Quilford became what the characters needed at that point. I had no preconceptions. He was entirely developed to support the story as it was in that moment. So I had what I described as an aging wizard hastily invite the party into his home, clearly wary of being seen. I had him check the windows for spies and built up an atmosphere of paranoia. And then I had Quilford examine the dark knife. Of course he would not touch it, as he immediately recognised it for what it was and what it meant. The dark knife was a rare dagger, used by assassins of a group of the same name. The dark knife assassins were a mysterious and expensive organisation, and Quilford could only guess they were active in Orton due to the finding of the heart of Moradin. Someone or something was clearly after it. As for the dark knife itself, it was a dagger plus two, but anyone suffering a killing blow from the weapon could never be raised, and became a white within 24 hours. So now my campaign had several things. A key event with the finding of the Heart of Moradin. The interest of a mysterious group of assassins called Dark Knife. A campaign specific weapon that served the emerging plot. A knowledgeable ally about whom there is still much to learn. And a party that could still be incriminated for the murders of Mayor Dorstal Meadquaffer and Frederick Corper. Due to being in possession of a Dark Knife. I was off and running and the players were eating it up but there was one final bit of setup to do to keep them on their toes. Dark Knife was watching, and I needed to let them know. And so, they received a mysterious correspondence. Dear friends, some terrible news has come to my attention. It seems that you have developed an unnatural interest in the affairs of your betters, those being the people who work for me. May I make a small suggestion? Look the other way. This small piece of advice can keep you healthy for a very long time. I hope it has the said effect on you. I have known a few people to ignore my advice, consequently I have not known them long, so forgive me if I say that I hope that I never have to meet you in person. So any interest you have shown in the past towards my business will be ignored if you grasp the meaning of this short note. There, I'm sure you feel a lot better now in the knowledge that you may see a little bit more of the world. Enjoy the rest of whatever it is you do. Signed, or Canthus. So, on top of everything else, Dark Knife has made contact with the party and warned them off. There are multiple threads for them to follow up, and I've got them looking over their shoulder when it comes to each one. However, when you think about it, everything is still quite localised. As a DM, I still have a grip on events and am planning out not only where things are going to go, but how they got to this stage in the first place, so as to give things precedent. The campaign is growing organically, but it is still controlled, and we're all enjoying it enormously. We've come from browsing the Map a Week page to a mysterious artefact and an organised crime gang in two adventures, and we're all in, 20 years worth. I'm going to stop there now before I go down a rabbit hole of what happened over all those years of play. I think you get the point. Start small and grow outwards, whilst seeking inspiration. 
Hopefully, this has been a useful trip in campaign design. I know my approach is far from perfect, but you may write a perfect campaign and your players still won't be able to agree a date to meet. Seriously though, there is no one method to campaign design, but hopefully the approach I took might inspire you to do just one thing differently. I'm Beck Me Berserker, keep making your saving throws and I hope to see you back here soon.